Thanks for joining everyone. I'm Mark and welcome to the first in a series of Norton Expert interviews. In a typical year, we wouldn't have a chance to sit with our customers and industry partners at IMTS, but this year is a little bit different. So instead, we're going to go virtually and give everyone on the outside a chance to hear what Norton thinks about what's happening within various markets, and also to hear about some of the newest products that we have. Before we get into the discussion on aerospace, I'd like to hand it over to Jamie for a quick introduction of our panel. Thanks, Mark. Um, as Mark just said, this is a, a team that's focused on the aerospace industry. So I'm going to quickly introduce everyone. I think everybody's names are on the screen anyway, but I'll go around um, and introduce our panel. We have representatives from the product management and product engineering team, as well as our application engineering group. Um, so from product management um, and product engineering, we have Jim Gaffney, Ryan Ellingworth, Jeff Holland, and Josh Fairley. And then from application engineering, we have Andrew Biro, Bruce Gustafson, and uh, Robin Bright. So welcome everybody, thanks for joining us today. Um, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, a little bit more about what's happening in the aerospace market and also what our newest products are that we already have on the market and what we're introducing. Great. So with that, I'll pass it back to Mark and we can uh, get started. Well, welcome everyone again. Let's get into the details. So for our first question, and I'll leave it open for anyone to take advantage of uh, talking about the answers here. What are some of the key trends that you're seeing in the aerospace industry today? You know, I was just going to kick it off by saying, obviously, it's a, it's a little bit of a tough industry right now overall. When you look at things like the you know daily number of commercial air travelers, uh, new aircraft or engine orders and deliveries, there's definitely reduced demand for air travel. And we certainly see that throughout our supply chain. But still, it's a situation where you know, we still need to be there for our customers. These are great customers for us. And it might mean working on a little bit different type of project together, maybe less so about number of parts out the door and more about other ways of, of uh, obtaining, you know, process cost savings. So definitely still a lot of challenges out there for us to address and uh, protect, perhaps even especially now, these, these are important challenges to, uh, to overcome. And I'll just I'll just add a little bit to that. You know, Robin, you brought up the point about you know, I guess new projects. Um, you know, I, we we see a lot of focus still on military type applications. Um, so you know, I think there's still a lot to be done, a lot of work to be done there. And I think there's sort of a a renewed focus there in some ways because there isn't necessarily the demand uh, that there was say a year ago on the commercial side. Um, so I, I think that. You know, we, we do see a big push on the, the military type projects. Um, and then the other thing that I, I see a lot of is, you know, uh, customer customers are focused on safety um, and within their plants. Um, and so there's a lot of, you know, questions and concerns on how do we make these products, A, the most efficient way possible, um, but B, also making sure that we're, we're maintaining high levels of safety, especially with everything going on now. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? So nope. something else we've seen in the industry is uh, the newer jet engines have newer material in them that are tougher to grind. So luckily we've developed new products to take care of this problem. Yeah, the, I you know from my standpoint, I see customers, they want better power to weight ratios in their engines. Um, and for aerospace, it's not just it's not just aircraft engines. I mean, you know, we're involved in uh, landing gear and and hard to grind components. We see our customers um, developing more and more different coatings and and materials hard to grind. And I feel we've stepped up to meet those challenges as a as a company and as a, as an abrasive supplier. Mm -hmm. I think we've also had to really um, stay flexible for the customer. There's been a lot of jobs that, you know, they seemingly come out of nowhere and we have to react really quickly or mm -hmm. um, or if demand changes, we have to react in a certain way. And I think we've really done a good job of um, supplying product to these customers mm -hmm. and uh, and reacting very well. Yeah. Sure down time, huh? And we have a full complement of uh, research and development people um, just outside of uh, just 20 miles east of our factory here and we're continuing trying to stay ahead of the curve of your industry to bring the best possible grinding wheels to to the solution mm -hmm. i think another trend that, that we're seeing a lot is trends in automation and mm -hmm. in flexibility of processes and we've seen that over the last really several years uh, particularly on the precision components um, 
where we use a lot of things like, you know, grinding wheel or diamond roll changers, um, and, you know, automation in that regard, um, flexibility on machine axes and configurations. We also see that that automation and flexibility in, in things like the, the aerospace foundry market or finishing or sanding uh, operations, whether it be for safety or for other reasons. Uh, we see a lot of automation, you know, all around aerospace right now. Mm -hmm. And I guess my, my last comment, um, which I had forgot before, but you know, we, we're starting to see a lot more of the, the digital transformation with a lot of our customers. Um, you know, I know RFID is sort of a, a big push at, at a lot of the, the aerospace accounts for you know, tracking things like how many times a diamond roll is used or you know, how many parts does a wheel get um, or, or just have basic information on the part that, that you could read in the machine and, and to Robin's point, allow you that flexibility and sort of that safety check to make sure that uh, you know what you want to run is is running in the machine. Um, and I think that that really stems, I guess, from a larger perspective towards towards the automation goal um, that we're starting to see. That's, that's a good point, Andrew. The data is really what's what's driving us today, right? Collection of data, interpretation of data. For the last couple of years for my tooling, my product at least, it was you know, customers really valued getting product there quickly and to be able to produce quality parts right off the bat. But now that we have some more downtime, it's about keeping up with those quality trends and making sure we're making much better parts on the shop floor. So for my products, it's been a lot of keeping up with your guys' development over the last couple of years in, in grain development and, uh, you know, searching for that shorter cycle time. But as Jim pointed out, we're continuing that trend now, um, even now with, with R&D studies. So we're continuing to look into tip wear and things that are important to aerospace customers um, to help with part quality over time. So we've, we've been quite busy, even though the orders are a little bit dipped this year. So uh, I think I'm hearing that you guys are actually getting a little more time, even with the downside of everything. You're, having, you're being able to spend more time looking at everything where I guess in a normal year, you might be rushed. You still get the same outcome, but now you're going back and say, well, what about this? Uh, different alternatives, safety, everything that you're included in the conversation today. So I think that's fantastic. It's a great way to fill your days. Well, uh, you raise a good point, Mark. I think that's really one of our you know, competitive advantages at Norton is that we're looking constantly at the whole system as a group. So this team right here on this call, Bruce and Josh and Jeff, um, Robin, Bright, Andrew, we're on the phone all the time looking at customer issues. And I think our unique perspective is we're looking at the whole system. We're not looking at making a, a tooling to a print or wheel to a print. We're looking at how our wheel wears on a customer's machine with certain types of coolant um, under different parameters. And we're having those conversations every week. So like you said, you know, we, we've been taking care of customers' needs. We're, we're an essential business, uh, but we're also looking forward to what's next. And we're learning along with our customers. Sounds good. So with everything that's affected our workspace, um, I'd like someone to share or a couple of you to share your perspective on how you feel the current state of the market is, not so much trends, but the overall market, if you will. I flew <laughs> yesterday to Chicago, uh, from Chicago, uh, Chicago, Boston, Boston, Chicago. Um, boy, air travel is really, O'Hare was almost vacant last evening. So I don't know how you want to put that into a, but I felt safe. So I felt safe and I felt secure and I was flying on a brand new 737 last night and I looked, I was sitting right over the engine and I felt super confident. Um, you know, maybe 95% of the people are all wearing masks. I felt very comfortable. I felt comfortable. Um, you know, there's always one or two that don't, but you just, you protect yourself. So that's what, that's how I felt. Yeah, the, the, the trends in the overall number of seats, you know, are, are expected to be down, I think, globally around 50 percent of what they were last year um, at, at the end of 2020. Um, we, we are starting to see an increase, at least the last numbers that I looked at from TSA did show an increase. And I think Labor Day weekend, they said, was the was the most traveled weekend in the last five or six months. So I think there was something like three and a half million people traveled over Labor Day weekend. So. Domestically, I think we're still seeing an, a, a slight increase over time, um, certainly from the low in, in April. Um, I think international is, is slow and is going to remain slow through the, the remainder of the year. Um, but, but certainly there are other countries internationally, uh, you know, China being one of them, that's, that's almost back to where they were in 2019. They're only down about 3% were the last numbers that I had seen. So, um, you know, the I guess the trends are there and, and certainly there are countries that are pushing to, to get at least domestic travel back up, um, but it, it'll be a little while still. You know, mo most estimates are 2022 to 2024 range before we're, 
we're kind of back in terms of total number of seats globally to where we were in 2019. And to Josh's point earlier, we are positioned for when the when the markets do recover mm -hmm. to to hit that hit that demand curve awfully hard. We have worked diligently to keep our workforce in place. We've got all our engineering and support staff in place. So we are absolutely poised to support this market as we always have strived to do. Yeah, there are some vendors out there that um, luckily, you know, they're able to bring in people and um, a lot of them have even brought in new product. You know, this the reduced demand, maybe it's the best time to bring in something more premium and see what their process is capable of. So we've seen that a few times as well. So the diversity of our products has deemed us an essential business. So that that being said, our um, our plants have remained staffed and we're ready for the demand because there are other markets that we have to support uh, health care, uh, medical, medical stuff. So our, our plants are ready to go. I guess that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, good comment. Well, that's another good point, Jeff, is we've had to be creative as an organization this year with all the supply chain challenges globally about getting product to customers. And being the fact that we're such a large organization, we in most cases have multiple manufacturing sites available too that we've been able to call on to support the needs of our different markets this year. And, and in the bonded world, this is where Josh and I work, mm. we're going to be introducing three new products this year. And they're they're all on the creep feed end use type applications. So even though the market is not expanding at the time, we are still introducing new products. Mm. So we'd like you to be on the lookout and see those products come to market. I'd say by the end of the year or first quarter. That's a good transition, Jim. Do you want to do you want to talk a little bit more? Do you want to switch gears and talk a little bit more about new products? I'll defer to Josh. He's a lot more technical than I am. <laughs> Absolutely. So, so, Josh, on the conventional bonded side, um, what do you see new? What do you see that's existing that we want to focus on and promote for our aerospace customers? Sure. Um, well, I think what we do very well at our company is evaluate where the cost savings are and, and what does the customer really want from us? So we have a pretty wide breadth of product where, um, for example, something that's very popular in the aerospace uh, creep feed and land-based turbine is converting uh, continuous dress operations to something more not continuous, where we can bring in a very popular uh, product, um, Quantum X. So we've had it a long time. It's not really new, but a lot of customers can really take advantage of it. On the other side of it, um, when demand finally comes back, um, we have a lot of shaped uh, ceramic grains, where you can see unprecedented uh, material removal rates. Um, so products like uh, TG and TG2, and coming soon is our next generation TQ and TQX. Um, so these are the these are the new products that we're really pushing. And then on the um, non-ferrous side, so there are some uh, customers where you really need to bring in um, a silicon carbide product. We have a new um, high-performance bond um, called BMT that we've introduced um, earlier in um, 2020. Excellent. Well, that's exciting. Um, what about on the super abrasive side, Jeff? Um, what do we have coming out and what do we have existing on the super abrasive side for our customers? Well, from super abrasive standpoint, we have a, we have a, a very superior market leading uh, creep feed, creep feed um, specifications for grinding um, hard to grind alloys, ink and L and, and, and the such, all the flavors of ink and L and, and the Renee's, um, we are, we, we definitely have a market leading, uh, technology there. Um, and what kind of product is that? Is it a VIT CBN product? That's, that's, that's vitrified, that would be vitrified CBN, um, creep feed product. Mm -hmm. So, and then, uh, from, for the hard to grind, like ceramics, spray coatings, and stuff like that, uh, we found a, a lot of nice fits for our paradigm, which is a brittle metal, uh, dressable metal bonded uh, diamond product. Um, mm -hmm. It's really shining in a lot of aerospace applications and others, and automotive and others. But 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 all we see a lot a lot of progress in aerospace with paradigm. So what is the what's the main benefit of that paradigm product? 
Uh, one of the big advantages of it is it's a multi-layer product that's dressable. So it's something that was that was uh, ground with a plated product uh, in, in the past. Now the uh, the customer can see the benefits of a multi-layer dressable product, increased productivity, less wheel changes, and and very high very high performance. Excellent. And economical also. So you have mm -hmm. to look at the economics. So it makes it very. Paradigm can make, uh, offer a very economical solution to the customer. So what's the feedback been from, from our customers on that Paradigm product and application team? Feel free to chime in if you've had experience. Uh, they're, uh, they're really excited with this new material they're using in the aircraft engines now. Uh, they've been uh, just paying an outrageous amount for a single layer plated wheels. So. When we introduced this uh, multi-layer to them, and we showed huge savings, in some cases over a million dollars a year. Wow. They're, they were really excited. So uh, as soon as that picks up again, I expect that to really work good. Excellent. Um, and then switching gears over to Ryan, um, tell us a little bit about dressing products. Yes. For us, it's really been you know keeping up with the development of both the super abrasive grinding wheels and the conventional bonded vitrified grinding wheels uh, across the board. If we look at you know grains like TG, TQ, Quantamax, uh, and Paradigm, these um, they're much more demanding of the dressing product. So we need to be able to supply a superior dressing product to be able to 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 meet the demands of Paradigm. So we can do that today across the platform. So what you'll see in traverse dressing, we offer what's called a BPR, a braised profile dresser. And this is kind of unique to us that, you know, a lot of uh, traverse dressing is done with a single layer diamond and the life can be short. And once you flatten out that diamond, it can cause you different uh, different uh, issues in, in, in surface finish. But the BPR is actually a consumable layer product. And to meet up with the demands of Paradigm, we've put CVD reinforcement in that. Uh, and that increased the life two and a half times uh, across the board. So that's been a really good leading product for us in traverse dressing. Uh, it just lends to the flexibility of Paradigm as a consumable layer product. Um, with, now that it's dressable, you can do much, you know, you have a lot of flexibility with the whole system. On the form roll side, you know, the trend, especially in aerospace, we've been leading the charge with CVD reinforcement on diamond form rolls for a few years. And I'd say that we we definitely have the ro most robust offering in terms of that. We have both infiltrated form rolls and reverse plated form rolls that uh, can dress Paradigm and, and TQ really across the board. But you know, like I pointed out earlier, I think our advantage is our ability to offer improvements over time. So we can get product there uh, very quickly to help support product runoffs or project runoffs, uh, new parts and things like that. But um, our advantage really is when we come back after we're in production and evolve from there. So we've got um, really a tiered product offering that can match up with our bonded and our super abrasive product offering today too. So, and again, more, more development to come from that. We're, we're spending a lot of time in, on studying tip wear and specifically in these creep feed applications. Excellent. Well, thank you, everybody. I think that's uh, really nice to hear that we have like a complete complement of, of products going from the conventional bonded to super abrasives. And then and then obviously dressing is very important as well. So it's nice to see that we're really uh, offering our customers a full complement of, of, of products. Um, all right. So tell me how this team, we have uh, product management, product engineering and application engineering. So tell me, how can this team help our customers today? So I'll say from the application engineering side, I mean, we are we are OK to travel to customers if they're willing to, to have us there to help them on site with, you know, troubleshooting, diagnosing, um, you know, process optimization. Um, but we're also working on other ways to help remotely, um, you know, so we have the ability, you know, if customers are willing to allow us to help them either via phone directly or via things like FaceTime, Microsoft Teams. Uh, video conferencing type technologies. Um, so, so those two types of things, we you know we have an entire team available across North America that can help um, you know any of our customers that are that are willing to test that maybe are restricted on who can enter the you know their their premises at this time. So, in the near term, that's that's one of our major solutions, and I, I think you know longer term, um, you know we we hope to be able to get back you know on site as much as possible to help with uh, with any new developments that they have. And Robin, uh, anything you want to say? 
Yeah, I mean, I just I just think, you know, we talked a lot about a lot of our newest product innovations and a lot of the tools that we have at our disposal to, to help our customers. And really, it, it, it depends on the on the unique problem that that customer is trying to address, um, whether it be cycle time reduction, improvement in tool life, improvement in scrap rate, uh, improvement in part quality, all of these things have a big impact on on overall cost savings. So that's really where, you know, whether it be remote support or on-site support, that's how uh, that's how our teams can uh, can help make a big impact at customers right now. Great. Well, I'm sure we're all looking forward to things kind of moving back into a normal normal activity. So, we'll be ready and willing and able to help our customers when that time comes. All right. Well, thanks everybody for your time today. Thanks Mark for helping out with the moderating and uh, we look forward to 2022 when we get back to IMTS in person. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.